following is a video presentation of a worship service at Orville Baptist Church. see everyone here. Uh, looks like we have a pretty good crowd here this morning. That's good to see. Hey, it's good to come into the Lord's house, and especially when it's nice and cool. I don't know about you guys, but I don't mind the heat, but that humidity with the heat really bothers me. But uh, it's, hey, like I was talking earlier, what can we do about it, right? Hey. Nothing. Just, just the Lord doing His thing. But anyway, like I said, welcome. Glad to see everyone here. We do have a few announcements that I'd like to go over with you first. Uh, uh, Wednesday, July the 22nd is the uh, bag packing night for the food pantry. Um, there will be a service at 6 o'clock in the CAC. Also, we have the uh, cars for the Congress congregational care bags, which are due next Sunday. And uh, this, maybe somebody can help us out because Carol was asking me earlier in the back back there. It says there's supposed to be a basket where you're supposed to place these cards in. Does anybody know? Is that just a the basket that the, uh, the bag and all that's in, or is there a special basket? Do we know? Okay, all right, thank you. All right. Um, these uh, completed bags will be distributed on Sunday, August the 2nd, so um, everybody be aware of that. Also, uh, the deacon nominations are coming up next Sunday, July the 26th. Um, the following people cannot be voted on. That's Sam Garrison, myself, Mark Garrison, Tommy Johnson, and Jimmy Brown. Um, we need to elect three men to serve. Um, two of those will be for a three-year term, and one of those will serve a two-year term to, to keep the rotation going from two deacons off and rotating on and off with two deacons. Um, but we really do need to be much in prayer about that, and I encourage each one of you to, 
you know, go to the Lord and, and consult the Lord and pray about that because these are, you know, you know, some times that we really need His, his intervention. So be prayerful about that. Um, also, there is some absentee balloting for the deacon elections. Um, if you need some, um, it's still ongoing this week at the church. I think there are certain times like a Monday from 9 to 1 and Friday from 9 to 11. Um, you can drop it off there. Or you can, uh, if you're unable to come by to the church at those times, um, give Sam a call and he said he will be willing to bring you a ballot or, or reach out to any deacon and they will meet you at the office or try to come by your home or something to give you a ballot. So please uh, do that. Also, we do have quite a few people on our prayer list. Um, we have uh, Laurie Pierce, which is the sister of Thomas Cease, um, Clarence Cease, the brother of Thomas Cease, and I think he came back uh, not positive for the COVID virus, um, which is, is good. I think he has some type of urinary tract infection. Right, Thomas? I think he's doing a lot better, right? Okay. Um, also, keep pray, uh, praying for Eddie Partain, um, Bessie Oxley. Uh, she's still out of NHC. Uh, I guess she's still quarantined, I guess. So can't really go and see her, but still be praying about her. Uh, Christine Gordon. Also, the uh, like to recognize the uh, um, um, Jerry Smith. That's the right? Yeah, that's what I thought. Pray for him as he passed away and his family. Um, he needs to be in prayer. Um, also, Deborah Henderson and Heath both are waiting on their... Uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, tests, so please be in prayer for, for those ones. And also, you know, I'm sure everybody keeps a regular prayer list of people they still pray for, but, you know, if you're not praying for some of these people, add them to your prayer list. And uh, prayer can go a long way, as we already know that. And...
in prelude to this, um, when this COVID thing, and none of us knew really how serious it was going to be, I asked God how I should respond to it. What should I do? What should I say? How should I feel? And he told me, don't worry. Now, most of us, when you say don't worry, it just kind of goes over your head, and it's like, okay, I won't worry. Well, now, almost five months later, it's still here. But so am I. About a month or so ago, I kind of pray and ask, has anything changed, God? <laughs> what is? What do you want me to, to do? Is there, is there a way that I should be responding to this? And he said, choose to believe me. I thought that was kind of odd, you know. He's told me to believe him before, but now he says, choose to believe me. Psalm 16. Keep me safe, O God, for I have come to you for refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my master. Every good thing comes from you. The godly people in the land are my true heroes. I take pleasure in them. Troubles multiply for those who chase after other gods. I will not take part in their sacrifices of blood or even speak the names of their gods. Lord, you alone are my inheritance, my cup of blessing. You guard all that is mine. The land you have given me is a pleasant land. What a wonderful inheritance. I will bless the Lord who guides me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. My body rests in safety, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. In these days of confused situations, in this night of a restless remorse, when the heart and the soul of a nation lay wounded and cold as a corpse, from the grave of the innocent Adam comes a song bringing joy to the sad. Oh, your cry has been heard and the ransom has been paid up in full. Be glad. Oh, be glad. Oh, be glad. Every debt that you've ever had has been paid up in full by the grace of the Lord. Be ye glad, be ye glad, be ye glad. So be like lights on the rim of the water, giving hope in a storm sea of night. Be a refuge amidst the slaughter of these fugitives in their flight. For you are timeless and part of the puzzle. You are winsome and young as a lad. And there is no disease or no struggle that can pull you from God. Be glad. Oh, be glad. Oh, be glad. Every debt that you've ever had has been paid up in full by the grace of the Lord. Be glad, be glad, be glad. And all God's people said, Amen. Praise the Lord. God is so good, and he is moving and working. I believe with all of my heart in these extremely difficult days that God is working. Acts chapter 2, and I know you won't have these scriptures on the screen today. Sam's on his way back, and, and we look forward to his return, as well as all who are not able to be here today for uh, their return but thank God that uh, these services 
uh, are broadcast and will be uh, put on the internet, YouTube, Facebook, et cetera, as, as uh, uh, Sam's able to do that. We're going back to the uh, book of Acts. I'm going to read from chapter 2 some selected verses that the Lord has put in my heart. And the central focus that we're going to uh, look at from this passage of Scripture that is God has led uh, is for us to focus on how can we win America. How can America be turned back to God? Acts chapter 2, verse 1. I thought maybe they had figured out how to do that, but uh, that's okay. Good deal. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord. You remember that? One accord in one place. Then verse 14. Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judah and all that dwell in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and heed my words. And then he gives a sermon. Verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and Peter, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and reality because of the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit of promise. Then verse 41, And those who had gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued, a key word, continued. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all those who heard were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, as everyone had need. So continued daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God, praising God, and having favor with all people, and the Lord, now it's the Lord, and the Lord added His work, and the Lord added to His church daily those who were being saved. Father, God, thank You. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be serving uh, these sweet people here at Orville Baptist Church. God, I pray uh, as we were so unctioned to, to pray earlier, uh, God, for this nation. And Lord, we know that the only hope is in Christ. And God, we know you've established these New Testament churches all over the land. And God, that you desire uh, that we walk in your holiness and your spirit, that you will be able to empower us and work through us, not us. We know we can do nothing without you. We know it's all you, God, all that you, you do it. We're just an instrument, and thank you, God, for allowing us to be an instrument, and we know that you give us stewardship over these bodies. 
that you give us the freedom to make choices. Uh, and God, I, I, I don't even know how to say this in a prayer to you, Lord, but, but God, help us. Uh, those who understand Armenianism, those who understand Calvinism, especially hyper-Calvinism, God, may we come uh, to see the truth of it all, that you're sovereign, and you're so sovereign that you give us a choice. You beckon for us to come, and for all to come, and whosoever will come. And God, as they repent, as Peter said here, you'll receive them, and you'll save them, you'll come to live in them. And God, thank you as they are given a demonstration to this world through baptism that they can go out in this world as a witness for you. And so, God, I, I pray now. I pray for this pastor search team. And, Lord, I don't know how you're going to let me preach the, this message, but I do know this, Lord. You put it deep in my heart that this church needs a strong, strong leader filled with the Spirit of God, with the boldness of God to stand and to lead. Sometimes maybe standing on an island by himself as God, you put me on that island by myself in so many situations in churches and as director of missions. But knowing you've spoken and to stand with boldness but with unction and with compassion and with understanding, understanding sometimes that the people don't understand and having the patience to lead. God, send this church a strong leader and send him soon that this congregation might be powerful in you and see many, 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 many souls saved out of this community and the surrounding area and literally around the world as they give and support missions. But right now, God, as we focus on this message, guide us and bless us in the name of Jesus. Amen. I love America, and I know you do. Uh, there's a deep, deep love in our hearts for this land. Uh, some of us here, a number of us, served in the military. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, be uh, the age of draft during the Vietnam War and uh, didn't know, scared to death, joined the Navy for four years rather than being drafted for two. And the experiences that came out of that and then the Lord allowed me to be in the Mediterranean Sea during the Six-Day War, uh, and even to be sent into the Black Sea when the Russians were doing all that they were doing to sell and to uh, have all of the dealings with the Russians that we had, knowing that any moment that uh, they could uh, turn on us and a war began and be blown out of the water. Uh, so many of us, uh, we were willing to give our lives uh, for this uh, great country. And I know that you, uh, you would be willing. I'd go back again if I could. <laughs> they wouldn't accept me because I can't hardly get up and down now. <laughs> but uh, much less do those things. But here it is. Uh, that us preachers, I've given my life, left the career that God had so blessed me with and answered the call. And thank God that we have the opportunity to make a difference in America. In my process of education, I became a student, too long a story to tell, but I became a student of Mars Hill College in North Carolina and had my eyes open to liberalism. I mean severe liberalism to the point to be taught that certain sections of the Bible did not belong. And I don't have time to elaborate those things, but I was introduced there for the first time 
to the higher critical method of interpretation, to read action criticism, uh, to all of the uh, liberal ways of looking at the Bible and being taught uh, that the Bible was not inerrant, it was not infallible, and to be taught how that you could find the errors in Scripture through uh, those different methods that they had developed and had to be able to defend all of that in writing before you could graduate. Uh, and that's a long story. But in that process, I was pastoring now. I had moved to Lockhart and driving from Lockhart up uh, to attend classes. I'm an adult student. We're just going one day a week or two days a week, depending uh, for the classes, and I had to be at least half time to keep my GI Bill going. And in the process of it, I decided, and I learned that in our seminaries, that they were primarily controlled by those kind of professors and and uh, even the uh, presidents of the schools. That this is where we were going, is where that the Southern Baptist Convention was turning. And I decided that if this is it, I'm going to become an independent Baptist. I'm getting out. I'm not going to fool with this mess. I, I can't do this. I can't support this. And I talked to my deacons at Lockhart about it. And then God rescued me by sending an advertisement in the mail that there was a school of the prophets being held at uh, the church in uh, Dallas, Texas, First Baptist where Dr. Criswell was pastor. And God put my heart to go there. And I approached my deacons about supporting me to go uh, to this school of the prophets. It was a one-week school. And they reluctantly agreed to help me financially to go if, <laughs> Frank, if I take a week's vacation to go. <laughs> and so I agreed, and, and they sent me. And all oh, was my eyes opened when I listened to Dr. Criswell and Adrian Rogers and Charles Stanley and Judge Pressler and Paige Patterson. I listened to these great men of God as they began to explain what was happening in our convention. And the challenge was, don't get out, get in. Get in and change this thing, young men. Get in and do it. And it took us some 25 years to turn it around. But God did it through us. And back in the day, you had to be incognita or you would be blackballed through the convention. You believe me? I met in Greenville with... Uh, uh, the lawyer there who took a process and there was uh, like a dirty dozen of us that uh, agreed with him and we would meet with him continually and we met at night so you could go <laughs> into his office without being seen and, and a, a, enough of that. But back at the School of the Prophets in one of the introductions to the full day Dr. Criswell preached the first message. And that message so stirred my heart. Now, you, if you've never been to Dallas First Baptist back in the day, uh, it was, it's still a huge sanctuary. And it was our largest church in the convention. And uh, Dr. Criswell preached such a dynamic message exposing the liberalism that had hit our convention. And I was so stirred by that. And he finished up a little bit early before we were to go uh, for the first class. And so Dr. Criswell, as only he could say, and I can't mimic him very well, but he said, well, we got a minute. Perhaps someone has a question. And you've got to realize now there were some 3,000 of us preachers. Now, my, and well, some of us had our wives. I had my wife with me. Perhaps somebody has a question. And my heart started pounding in me. Now, I wasn't just barely over 30, but I, I thought I was going to pass out. My heart was pounding. And I know the Spirit of God said through me, stand and ask Dr. Chris, well, the next time he has opportunity 
to, would he please preach that sermon to the entire convention? And I didn't do it. And the guy popped up right in front of me. I don't mean anywhere else in that huge balcony in church with all of those preachers, but the guy right in front of me stood up. And you know what he asked Dr. Criswell? One of the greatest minds God's ever given us in theology and understanding things. You, you get his books and read. You get his uh, own eschatology and read. And, but anyhow, here's Dr. Criswell. And this guy asked him, he said, Dr. Criswell, how many people will this sanctuary seat? Well, that's something to ask the great mind of God, isn't it? And boy, my heart's still pounding. And Dr. Criswell, he looked at that gentleman, he looked around and he said, I don't know, a bunch. And the guy sat down. And before I knew it, I'm standing up. And Dr. Criswell says, yes, young man. I said, Dr. Criswell. <laughs> I was scared out of my wits. Uh, I said, would you, would you consider if God allow you, would you uh, preach this sermon at the convention next time you have opportunity? He said, thank you, young man. He said, would you all like that? <clears throat> no, I can't talk, I'm still talking like me. Would you all like that? And they started clapping. I mean, a resounding clap all over that building and ended up standing all over that building clapping. And Dr. Criswell, when he got him seated, he said, young man, I'll just do that. Would you please come to the platform before you go to your first class and I want to meet you. <laughs> Me with Dr. Criswell. And there's a point to all this. When I got up there and he was enthroned with people and finally he said, come here, young man. And I went up there and he said, I want to know why are you here and da 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 and I began to explain to him. And I said something like this to him. I said, Dr. Criswell, what can I do? I'm pastor at Lockhart First Baptist Church. We're growing, God saving people, and and uh, and uh, the church is just experiencing a powerful move of God. But what can I do, sir, with this whole situation? You know what he said to me? He said, "Young man, you go home and you keep your island pure." I can't talk like him. You ever heard him preach? Pure. I knew what he said. I comprehended it. I understood it. I couldn't do a thing about what was happening in the convention that we were controlled from the top down with liberals. South Carolina, same way. Baptist Courier, same way. And what could I do? But go keep my Alan, pure. And I took that serious. I took it serious all the way to when God called me to be director of missions of Piedmont Baptist Association. And in my interview with them, I told them some of that story. And I said, now if this association calls me as your director of missions, I will do everything that God will allow me to do to keep this island pure. And you know what? God honored it. I was committed to work with everyone, just as I was as a pastor, to work with every church member, regardless of situations. But it was that my challenge was to keep the island God gave to me to lead pure. And so it is now as interim pastors, a whole different thing. But to help the church prepare for the next pastor and keep the island pure. How can we win America? It's going to start right here. It's going to start in all our churches. 
with all our pastors being filled with the Spirit of God. I've been praying this last week and this week more than I have in a long, long time. And God has stirred my heart. I even was singing, John, <laughs> coming into the church unto the Lord <laughs> and praying uh, for a, to give me more than I've ever had in unction, more than I've ever had in, in his power, more than I've ever had in his vision for what needs to be. And I'm not going to be able to preach. This is just barely in the introduction. But I believe God has given us the message. I'll continue maybe next Sunday with this. Probably will. God leads. I know I will. But it's going to take more than our 5,000 plus home missionaries to reach this United States and see it turn back. It's going to take every church, every person to make disciples. It's going to take us being evangelistic churches. It's going to be that we learn how to fight the devil and not one another. And certainly in this book of Acts, chapter 2, uh, we, we see the answer. And the answer really is simple. To take this to heart as to what God can and will do through this. I'm going to give you the overview of the outline and then hopefully next week we'll get down uh, to what we call the meat of it. The outline comes from my first church. Where in the world I got it from, I don't know. Maybe God gave it to me. I was a student at Fruitland Bible Institute and and the homiletic professor, Kenneth Ridings, he alliterated everything. And, and he gave us a lot of different thoughts and sermons up there. Maybe it come from there. But here it is. That if we're going to win America, it's going to take power-packed pews. You just start thinking about that. Power-packed pews. Number two, and it's all in this chapter two of Acts. It's going to take a power-packed pulpit. The man of God that you all are going to call. The most critical time in the life of a church is right now. As you're seeking for your next pastor, if God sends you the man who is full of him, who is in boldness, who will study, and you give him time to study and to pray, and to come to this pulpit full of a message of God to preach from the overflow, anointed of God in that, and he packs this pulpit with power, you watch what God will do through the foolishness of preaching. So you got power packed pews with a power packed pulpit. And you know what that will produce? It'll produce peculiar people. Hmm? It will produce peculiar people. People anointed of God. Who the world will call you peculiar. They'll see you as different. And as we talk about this, if God lets us next week, you'll see what peculiar people will do. And how they will do and what they will do. And so it is of essence. If we're going to win America, it's going to take us with power pack pews. I'll probably say this next week. But you've got a roll. I don't even know how many is on your roll. Anybody know how many is on your roll? A number? I don't know either. I, have no, I don't have a clue. 500. Over 500. What will this church seat? 500? I don't know. A balcony and all, maybe a little more. 
Now, I know coronavirus is here, so don't you hear anything I'm not saying. But where are they? When we come home and have that revival we talked about last week, and God anoints us, you see what happens. Then you put this preacher up here to train, to lead. He's got to be a leader. Every time God's about to do something, he calls a leader. Strong leadership. Quality number five, I guess, because you've got to start with his salvation, his call to preach, his walk with the Lord, etc. But he's got to be a leader. A leader that's willing to lead. We'll talk about that in detail if God gives the opportunity. And then when... God moves. We'll see. I, Frank, I got, God woke me up in the middle of the night. Uh, I got a whole bunch of notes in here I was going to open up and, and to read. Maybe I'll be able to type them for next week. But do you understand something about what, uh, what God's saying this morning? I, I believe that overview is a good thing for us. And there's an overview, but it comes down to where are you? Where am I? Where am I in this battle? And we're in a battle. Uh, we're, we're, we're not fighting flesh and blood. Don't ever think that. We're not fighting flesh and blood. We don't kill one another. As bad as I hate the liberals that are in our government, no, and hate's the wrong word, it, and it's, it is a godly anger. Uh, you know you can be angry and sin not. That's a whole other sermon. But it is a, Jesus was angry when he went in and turned over the money changers money in the temple. But he didn't sin. But there's a godly anger about what's happening now that America's being fooled and sold such a false message. I, I, I'm going to close. Do, have you all ever been to the stones that are erected in Georgia not too far from here? There's, there's stones, kind of like the uh, uh, stones wherever it is uh, over in Athens or, or someplace. I've, Stonehenge, I've never been there, been close to it. I, if I'd have known, probably it would have uh, one of the chaplain tours gone there. But uh, the, the bottom line is there's stones erected uh, not too far from here in Georgia, standing up. Ann and I, we discovered it. We, we love to do day trips. Now, we hadn't in a long time, but we would find different things searching on the Internet for day trips and, and just get in the car and ride off and, and hunt those things and, and uh, eat somewhere. And, of course, we can't do that now. But she said uh, this week when in one of the messages, uh, listening to some great preacher talking about how that America's fallen, and we're listening to an awful lot of, of those guys on the uh, internet, great, great, great men of God, uh, warning us what's happening. And one of them said, even the stones in Georgia have the communistic uh, words to it, and so we want to ride back there and read on those things and see uh, what's happening. But our nation, do we get it? I believe we do. Father, this has gone so different, so different than I had planned. But as Frank talked to us Wednesday night about just putting our feet into the water and watch you in the flood days of the Jordan to back up the water. God, I believe you've allowed me to put my feet into the brink of the Jordan this morning for this sermon. And I pray, God, that you'll send us back to our places with a commitment in our heart that we want and we pray for this church to have pews filled with people of God that are packed with your power. And then, God, to send these sweet people of 
leader of leaders to come here and to have this pulpit packed with your power. And then God, as you touch us with the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God and we go out into this world, what a difference we'll say. What a difference. And God, we know we're important. You put us here in these last days. You put us here when there's one of our two parties in this United States that is strongly pushing for a world government, for communism to take over America and to, to destroy our religious freedom and to, uh, they're promoting killing babies by the millions and claiming Black Lives Matter when they kill so many black babies every year. And God help us to search and to see What's behind Black Lives Matter, the, the full agenda that's there. Help us not to be fooled by just words that are put on the front end. Help us, God, to see what's going on and what's happening, that our, the Holy Spirit to open our eyes and to realize that we're in these last days and all that's happening in and around Israel, how that, God, you are preparing for the coming of your Son. And help us, God, in these days to be as serious as serious can be and be warned. We know that, God, you've set a watchman to warn us. And may we heed, may we study, may we pray. May you enlighten us, God, as to the times we're in these critical times. And God, may it be. And I know that we have uh, this coronavirus and to distance ourselves as best we can. And, and God, there's so much about this. But right where we are, God, would you just anoint us, convict us, and may we repent and surrender unto you. In the name of Jesus, amen.